Okay, so um, with no further ado, welcome everyone to the this morning's uh, paper session um, on general topics of uh, interaction, sort of uh, network thinking and, and gesture. Uh, our first presenter today will be Stefano uh, Colonaris uh, on his paper, um, a scheme for music interaction design and notation based on dynamic. Uh, the podium is, is yours, thank you. Okay, um, trying to keep it brief because uh, I understand we are running a little bit late. Uh, but yeah, it's great to be here at Tenno. This is my first time. And uh, so far I've been really enjoying all the fantastic papers and the works that have been presented. Um, I work at Riken AIP in Japan, um, mostly on tasks uh, around computational creativity, uh, computational musicology and generative systems. So this is a little bit of uh, an odd one for me. Although I did uh, uh, work in, in this direction during my PhD studies. Uh, so today I'm presenting my thoughts on interaction design and notation based on um, uh, social network theory, if you wish. Um, okay, so music interaction is a continuum, this much we all know. Uh, one end, we could place musical composition, which is uh, perhaps uh, one of the strictest approaches to interaction, defining roles, times, uh, musical content. And towards the opposite end of the spectrum, we could place free musical improvisation, which does make predefined commitments and relies on real-time negotiation of the musical space. Between those two poles, there are countless variations that try to blend improvisation and composition. And these blends normally abide by a top-down design, still aiming to provide expressive and improvisational opportunities to the players. So normally these blends require bespoke notation systems and methods, which is what this conference is all about, um, I guess. Um, some of these notation systems are listed on this slide, uh, on the uh, left-hand side, although uh, not meant to be exhaustive. And normally in this context, um, time is conceived as linear, even including circular or periodic structures. That is, um, temporal dependencies are viewed as a serial procedure, event A happens before event B and so forth. And this is also often the case in computer-aided notation for interactive performances, for example, responsive scores. Therefore, motivated by this desire to expand on linear and sequential representation of musical interactions, I draw from social network theory. Why? Why social network theory? Well, networks are useful to study multi-agent systems, which are often synonymous of complexity. And it's arguable that music ensembles are also multi-agent systems, socio-musical networks, so to speak. Therefore, I consider social network analysis uh, to be an interesting tool to design, represent, and, um, and express musical interactions. So first of all, a few general considerations on networks. I assume a basic understanding of the network theory terminology. And I apologize if some of the terms might sound unfamiliar. So we can think of a network as a systemic architecture where elements connect and interact with each other. And normally we represent it as a system of connections else called edges between nodes, normally called vertices. There are many model architectures in graph and social network theory. However, most of them are very difficult to map to the music domain. For example, uh, in the erdos rani random graph model here on the left-hand side, um, nearly all the nodes will have the same degree. Also, nodes don't get to decide who to connect with, nor when. Uh, in the watson strogatz model, the one in the middle of this slide, which is also known as the small world model, or the six degree of separation, what have you, uh, this model has a small average shortest path length, a large clustering coefficient, and manages to address the absence of hubs, which are nodes with a typically high degree. 
However, it's still eminently stochastic. The scale-free model, finally here, uh, abandons randomness as a principle behind complex social networks, thanks to the notion of preferential attachment. However, the scale-free network grows to comprise a huge number of nodes, far exceeding the typical largest musical orchestra. And it doesn't need to be so, but the prevailing norm in music composition is to have a fixed number of players with a maximum around 100 for, a, say, Wagner-type symphonic orchestra. Instead, we look at the affiliation network as a possible candidate for music interaction. An affiliation network is also known as a two-mode network and is described as a network in which actors are joined together by common membership of groups or clubs of some kind. This is an interesting model and it manages to introduce some non-trivial behaviors and a deviation from the low clustering coefficient of a random graph. In terms of representation, we can represent it as a bipartite graph where the top, uh, the top nodes here would be the events and the bottom, the numbered ones would be the actors. And based on the interaction strength, the edges in the bipartite network can be weighted using a ratio scale. So four is twice two and so forth. Else we can represent an affiliation network as a hypergraph on the left-hand side of this slide. Or we can do without the graphical representation altogether using an incidence matrix um, where rows are um, the events and columns are the actors and their affiliation to any given event is expressed as a binary value. Affiliation networks are interesting because they show how actors and events are related, how events create ties among actors, and how actors create ties among events. In general, they exhibit non-overlapping nested or overlapping relations. Uh, furthermore, two mode networks can include synchronous events, which actors are free to choose from. And these affordance can be particularly useful if we want to foster musical interactions that unravel and develop in multi-level fashion. So to analyze the relations that emerge in a two-mode network, we can use one-mode projection. For example, the one-mode projection of the events, A to E of the earlier example, is obtained by constructing a five vertex network, such that every event is connected to another if there is at least a member that participated both. Conversely, the one more projection of the nodes, one to seven, is obtained by connecting actors who have been part of the same event. Now this one mode projections lose some of the information of the bipartite graph. Despite this, despite the partial loss of information, these one mode uh, projections can be useful to calculate shortest paths in the two mode network. And we do this simply by projecting on, onto either actor or events and calculate the path lengths as we would normally do in a regular graph. Next, we look at some interesting properties of this um, um, network model. And we start with co-affiliation. This can be derived using a pairwise actor contingency table as shown in this table here on the left and which refers to nodes one and two in the earlier example. The quantity A is a measure of the number of times that nodes one and two co-attended an event. We can normalize it by dividing it by N and this can be useful to compare other pairs of nodes. Else we can divide it by a plus B plus C, and that expresses A in relation to the events that are possible to attend. Uh, another property, the interesting property in the network is centrality. And this has been defined in different ways. For example, it's been defined based on degree, which tells us how active an actor, in our case, a player, is in the network. Uh, defined by eigenvectors, which reveals if a, cent a central actor has ties with other central actors. Closeness expresses how short the potential paths to the other actors are. And betweenness, which is the potential to mediate between other actors. 
Finally, coming to sociometric analysis. So these measures can be useful to analyze the network. For example, we could deduce who are the more central actors and the more central musicians, uh, players or events, uh, how this relate to one another and the eventual overlaps of memberships and in general, try to capture inner structures and behaviors. Wilson in 2019 in this very conference um, enumerates three main approaches in response in schools uh, based on either low level audio, mid level performance data and high level score data. He then goes on to add a fourth approach um, leveraging on machine learning to classify latent music, music agents and based on telemetric data. So today in this talk, I put forward yet another approach based on sociometric data. Um, in our context, time is a non-negotiable factor. So in music, we cannot do without time dependencies. And we need to account for this when we compute sociometric data. So to this end, we can introduce a notion of sampling and the rate at which players make changes in the outgoing ties could be named rate function, for example. These are repeated network snapshots, so discrete observations that can be used to compute the measures that I discussed earlier, as well as for generating time explicit graphs for visualization purposes. You can see an example here on the left hand side. On the right hand side instead is an example showing the evolution of uh, four players uh, degree over time taken from a real performance, uh, one of the systems that I designed for network performance. Uh, in this slide, uh, this is a completely speculative example of an affiliation network based score. And the content of the events is, uh, is arbitrary. So I, I was trying to, to show you the interactions can be as complex as one wishes um, them to be. And the design framework based on, on this affiliation network should be medium agnostic and should be realized in whichever form is most congenial to the designer. So to this end, I kept the specifications of the scheme to, to the bare minimum to allow flexibility. One thing is specific choices depend on being able to route membership, membership uh, excuse me, decisions back to the network for the sake of the sociometric analysis. So this routing can be done in many different ways. For example, hand signals, foot pedal array, numerical keypad, graphical user interface, um, and so forth. The networked music performance paradigm is the obvious choice. And uh, so the system could be configured as a client server topology and the server could host the score so the events, so to speak, um, analyze the sociometric data so the players are connected and disconnect to, to the um, various um, events that are available. And potentially feeding back this sociometric data back into the system at some level. So for example, if there was a case that a particular event, so a subscore, if you wish, uh, was consistently poorly attended, then the system could be um, uh, designed so to replace it with a suitable alternative. Um, I can try to play this video. Wish me good luck. This was one of the performances of the system uh, from which the um, sociomedic data was taken from. Um, so to summarize, graph models can be useful for exploring modalities of musical communication, interaction, and creation, whether more composition oriented or more improvised. However, one must consider carefully the structural and dynamic characteristics of the chosen graph model. I argue that affiliation networks can offer an interesting perspective because they allow concurrent options for the players to choose from. And in so doing, they expand the paradigm of sequential time. Providing that non-intrusive and integrated ways to route membership decisions are implemented, 
sociometric data analysis can be fed back into the network and thus injecting the musical process with um, real-time opportunities to morph and adapt if one so wishes. The bad news is that this model is purely speculative at this point, therefore it remains to be seen whether or not it constitutes a valid scheme and flexible enough to accommodate and cater for a wide range of uh, musical needs. And with this concludes my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you very much, Stefano. Um, does anyone have any questions? Hello? Uh, well, um, I, I have questions. Um, I'm curious, I mean, it seems like a really um, potentially very interesting approach. Um, and it seems like you, you know, you said it was speculative, but you you did you have used it a little bit already in in some performances um i'm curious um about what what the experience was of of being a part of these performances and also curious about the to hear more about the way that you're collecting the data um and how that plays into the system yes i think i'm getting a super beautiful glitch in my Camera on the knife. Yeah, it looks great. Fun. It's like a nice pink thing. It's good. Yeah, a genuine glitch. How often does that happen? Um, so yeah, this the system that um, was shown there was slightly different. So it was based on uh, um, Markov networks. So, but the but the kind of the it was based on the same idea of using graph models um, to structure live interactions. So the players had um, as options um, musical personalities, not actual events. So I haven't implemented the the concurrency of events in terms of giving different musical choices to the to the and different musical scenarios to the players. Now the general feedback, which is one I've commented, tried to to comment um, a couple of times during the presentation was that sometimes interacting to with a with a GUI or uh, the numerical pad was taking um, away the players from the from the flow if you wish of the music performance so one thing to 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 be careful with is to try to have this routing as painless as smooth as possible so to keep the the musical flow um since then i haven't had much much um opportunity to 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 further this work so it's it's all in the, in the future i'm afraid i uh, i also have a, a quick question um um i i uh, went through your um uh, references and i noticed that you were also quoting um uh, or at least um listing a paper by uh, uh, Caro Rebello and uh, let me see again um, and Renault. Um, are you also aware of the uh, of um, Pedro Rebello's other writings on network topologies? For instance, there's a paper on by by, uh, uh, by Rebello and Schroeder. Um, it's very interesting stuff. Have you have you been uh, going through that research? Yes, um, um, Francisca Schuller was my supervisor during my PhD, actually, and I, I know Pedro personally. I see. Okay, I, I've yeah. had a, I've had quite um, a chance to, to to read up on the. Okay, that's um, great. That's wonderful. So, um, um, uh, it's great to see that their work is also being, you know, picked up on. And um, <clears throat> what I was. Um, Still, uh, I mean, I, I, I thought it was a fascinating uh, paper. I'm, I'm, I'm also going to uh, read the, um, the original text. Um, uh, what I was uh, also wondering a little bit about was how, how, how do you, um, in what relation is the actual practice that you're establishing to the theory that you're uh, putting forth? I mean, um, did you did you find it easy to to create these correspondences by going through from theory to practice, or was your work actually informed first by musical practice, and then you have derived your theory from that? 
Um, it was to, maybe it was the, the the they came at the same time, so so to speak. Um, I I have a past of uh, as if as an improviser, so I made a living with uh, playing improvised music. Um, um, and so I, I played with with um, large ensembles, and there's always been a problem. You either have, say, Ala Batch Moritz, so you have like visual cues or London improvised orchestra, so you have um, physical cues um, or pre rehearsed um, fragments uh, that, that musicians can, can elaborate on. Um, otherwise, you have, you always have some, some sort of system uh, that gets developed and um, um uh, if you want becomes a little bit geomatic within the ensemble and so what i wanted to to experiment with was um to leave the players completely free and and hopefully um defer the organization to the actual um graph model that underpinned the 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 system so um the first thing i had to 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 not fight, but um, negotiate was a little bit of resistance from improvisers normally to having to, to play with the systems. But uh, what it came out, um, this was done with um, um, focus group analysis and uh, um, sort of um, um, questionnaires that they actually um, um, convened, convened that the interaction was at times quite structured and and uh, perceived at different levels like there's different um, clusters of, of musical interaction that were happening and would be perceived at the same time and so that I, I considered um, a result of how I uh, mapped the theory to the to the ensemble which was a pleasing a pleasing result Great. Um, sorry to interrupt the conversation, and I see Slavko yeah. also has a, a question, um, but we'll have to um, follow up on this conversation uh, later so that we can continue on with the next presentation. So thank you very much, Stefano, and uh, thank you all. I'd like to welcome next um, uh, Takuto Fukuda. Uh, welcome. Uh, Hello. Hello, uh, and he will be presenting uh, his paper, Super Collider's A Gamified Screen Score. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Takuto Fukuda, affiliated to uh, Edmir, uh, the Input Device and Musical Interaction Laboratory, Kermit, and Digital Composition Studio at McGill University. So I'm going to talk about my gamified composition entitled Super Colliders for three pitch instruments or vocals and gamified screen score. The piece was performed at the Fixed Media Concert on the first day of this tenor conference. So in this presentation, um, I will first talk about the piece and its game design, and then uh, I will present identified game elements in the piece. And finally, I will present a, a performance analysis of the piece. So Jason Freeman points out the problem of an extreme sight reading in music performance with a real-time generated screen score. Performers seldom have the opportunity to study the screen score prior to the performance as the system often generates a unique version of the score in real time during every performance. And most screen score show musical symbols or graphics for only a few seconds on a video display during the performance. These limitations shield the performers against the risk of misinterpretation, which conflicts with the concept of perfection prominent in an age where the proliferation of music records has heightened audience engagement with the reproduction of recorded performance in concerts. This cultural condition highlights the game aspect inherent in music performance, namely the performer's challenge to achieve perfection, that is a game of either success or failure. 
super colliders explore an alternative approach to turn the risk of misinterpretation into the engaging performance, embracing the game aspect of music performance by combining gamification with screen score in interactive system design. A key approach was gamifying a screen score and fixed playhead model, a uh, scrolling score and fixed playhead model in a taxonomy of animated scores. This approach enabled me to design a performance ecosystem in which the interactive computer system poses challenges as musical symbols, which the players must interact with to perform. So I explain the goals and rules of the uh, gamified composition. The players compete with each other in four rounds of the game. One grand winner is identified at the end of the game. To be the grand winner, a player must win the most rounds. Players must earn 1,080 life points faster than other players to win each of the four rounds. They crush their avatars with blobs moving continually from left to right on the screen score to earn life points. The players begin the game with 540 life points. Players earn one life point per crash. However, all three players lose a point if all of them miss a crash. So therefore, uh, there are two possible consequences of the game. One scenario is that one musician earns the most points, so he or she wins the round. Another option is an all dead scenario, meaning all musicians, all the musicians lose and the computer wins. But notably, the third round is designed such that a human player always wins. The game file screen score shows uh, three types of elements, three musician avatars, three life point indicators, and moving blobs. The moving blobs represent musical notes in the MIDI file, as well as targets with which the avatars must collide to earn life points in the game. The performers control their avatars by playing ascending or descending glissandi quietly or loudly. The pitch change is mapped to the vertical position of the performer's avatars. Loudness is mapped to the horizontal position and the size of the avatars. The avatars are aligned on the right side of the screen when the performer plays silent or very quietly. Now I would like to play a one minute excerpt of the performance of the piece. The interactive computer system is effective when optimizing the challenges difficulty to the commensurate level with the performance skills. To achieve this, uh, the computer system consists of two components, a MIDI sequencer and a second order Markov chain algorithm. The MIDI sequencer solves the initial seed challenges and the algorithm monitors the performer's ability and adjust the difficulty level of subsequent challenges in real time. The MIDI sequencer outputs MIDI notes from the pre-programmed MIDI sequence of Baha invention number one as elements of the challenges. The system visualizes the MIDI notes as blobs on the screen score. 
Second order Markov chain algorithm uh, plays a key role in optimizing growth behaviors. These behaviors have a significant impact on the level of challenges posed to the performers. The algorithm continues tailoring the difficulty level according to performance history of success since the beginning of the performance. The Markov chain algorithm's behavior changes in every round. During the round one, the algorithm learns the blobs, moving blobs representing the musical notes in the Baha invention number one. During the performance of the first round, the algorithm creates a state transition matrix that stores the weight of the probability of every pitch progression between three subsequently crushed uh, MIDI nodes represented by blobs on the screen score. In the following rounds, the algorithm plays uh, two tasks simultaneously. Uh, one is generating a blob sequence according to weighted random choice of pitch progressions entered in the state transition matrix and renewing uh, the weight of the uh, probability based on the newly detected pitch progressions represented by blob collisions. Notably, the state transition matrix is not flushed after every round, but maintained for the further renewal in subsequent rounds. Progressions are detected in three different ways. During round one and three, they are detected when moving blobs on the screen score collide with avatars. During round two, they are detected when moving blobs are missed by all avatars. During round four, they are detected when blobs are intercepted and missed by avatars. The studies on motivational affordance suggest that a peripheral human computer interaction emerges when users' motivational needs are met and competence, one of the motivational needs, is afforded at the highest level when the level of difficulty is commensurate with the performance, performance skills. Hence, it is suggested that the target scenario of the game is a close battle, which means players, including the uh, computer system, win fairly throughout the game with close life point scores. Notably, among many other elements in this piece, moving blobs are uh, the only variable element the system uses to adjust the difficulty of the challenges to the performance skill level. Therefore, movie, uh, blob behaviors appears to be the most essential element that sways the emergence of playfulness in the game. So here I described an analysis of how the future featured element of moving blobs affects the emergence of playfulness and the musical results, referring to the uh, performance by members of the professional strings quartet, the Ligeti quartet. There's unfortunately no way to compete, uh, compare the final life point scores of the performance as the precise life point data were not recorded. However, the approximate life points on the video recording of the screen score are available. Additionally, since close battle result in a longer round, it is possible to infer the closeness of the battle by comparing the duration of each section in the performance. This comparison reveals how close the battles are indirectly. So therefore, uh, this analysis focuses on the following. One is how many times each performer won throughout the performance and uh, how long each round lasted in the performance. So my analysis eliminates the influence of broad behaviors on the time structure and choice of the following parameters. Playing techniques, contour types, dynamics, and ensemble unit, which means a musical unit built by a performance of more than one player. So rather than going deep into every detail, I would like to discuss what can be inferred from the analysis. My analysis eliminates the influence of the future growth behaviors on two different aspects of music performance, competitiveness, and the emergent musical structure. Competitiveness is related to the performer's engagement with the game aspect of the music, while the emergent musical structure is related to the performer's contributions to the form and the components in the music. 
For competitiveness, the result of the performance brings into question the effectiveness of a Markov chain algorithm in optimizing the difficulty level of the developer behaviors. As mentioned before, cross battles are the crucial component of engendering preference in gameplay. However, analysis reveals that the strong deviation in the result of the game. The second violin won twice and the old scenario occurred twice. Neither of the other players won a round. It is remarkable that the uh, rate of victories by the computer against human players was even. The results suggest that the chain challenge was optimal for the three per performers playing against the computer as a group. Furthermore, the uh, longer duration of the second round indicates that the Markov chain algorithm's optimization of probe behaviors was effective to some extent. However, the challenge is not balanced between the three players. One prospective modification for this problem is to implement some kind of functionality to impose different levels of challenges to each of the three players, which means introducing the concept of handicapping in some ways, such as decreasing the input gain of the advanced player. Regarding the uh, emergent musical structure, it became clear that the moving blocks often resulted in dividing a round into at least two sections and sometimes three sections before and after the blob arrived in the avatar's vicinity. During the former, the uh, musicians performed, performed some complex musical units in collaboration, such as a uh, synchronous unit, which is this one. And a cadence. and a fugato. The moment before the arrival of the booming probe seems to have been a free time for the musicians. In contrast, after the moving blobs arrived in the avatar's vicinity, the performers choose to play more favorable materials with advanced dynamics for winning the game rather than performing a complex musical unit as an ensemble. It tended to draw a clear border between the section before and after the moving blobs arrived in the avatar's vicinity. This observation suggests that there might be a compensation between the risk of defeat and the musical freedom. If this hypothesis is proven to be reasonable, the competition might not be always the most effective gamification archetype to invoke playful interactions between human players and the computer. Notably, the broad behaviors play a pivotal role in weighting the emphasis of the performance on either competitiveness or musical structure. Different forms of broad groups influence the choice of musical, par musical parameter settings. For example, a linear array often invoked uh, competitiveness. Players tended to await the arrival of the broad array at the same position in height in this case, the performer tends to play louder to intercept the brave further away before the other performers reach them. This situation turns the performance into the dynamic level competition. In contrast, the widespread brave sequence emphasizes the musical structure. Performers tended to reposition their avatars vertically on the screen score by playing the gris sandy. The pitch changes sometimes entailed interweaving the contrapuntal lines Thus, the performance was more focused on the musical structure. So Superprider applied the concept of gamification to the screen score to invoke playfulness in performer-computer interactions. 
and a closed battery is aimed for the, the, um, engaging performance. Blow behavior is uh, an important element to engine the uh, uh, closed battle. And uh, to realize more engaging performance, I found that the need of uh, need to modify the Markov chain algorithm in order to optimize the challenges difficulties to the commensurate level with the performance skills. Also, I consider to introduce the concept of handicapping in this game piece. And the performance analysis reveals that there might be a compensation between the risk of defeat and the musical freedom. And the, finally, as a, another finding is that broad behaviors play the pivotal role on weighting the emphasis of performance on either competitive or musical structure. So that's uh, everything. Thank you very much for this. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Um, we're running a bit behind schedule, um, uh, but I see that our next presenter has a question. So that's perfect. Uh, Gilles, would you like to ask a question? Gilles, uh, you're muted. Are muted? Yes, now, now you're okay. Yeah. okay, sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yesterday too, there was a problem, I don't know, but now just, uh, it's just a different uh, audio device. Um, I, have, I have a question about style, musical style, and how how do you, if you give any indication for style and how do you approach a style in this kind of piece? Um, I was wondering, like, for example, because there are parts when they play like freely with uh, different, uh, I would say, like a more free uh, pitch collection. And then if they go to like a more tonal cadence, how, how does it work and how so, do you sell it? Yes. So there's basically no prescribed score in this piece, then score is largely indeterminate. So therefore uh, the players are basically kind of free to play whatever they want to play actually. However, I gave um, kind of written instruction, uh, which basically says that they should be engaged with playing a game actually. So then, uh, in the case of Ligeti, um, Ligeti strings carded, they really considered what they play by themselves. And so, yeah, that's basically the answer. So there's really no um, indications about the style of the performance. Yes. So however, you know, the, um, I can say that the whole game interface and what comes out, you know, from playing a game probably somehow inspires the performance, in my opinion. So then that probably um, kind of, you know, brought the members of the Ligeti Quartet into some kind of, uh, uh, let's say, enjoyable or funny, uh, uh, funny uh, musical materials, I think, such as cadence. Yeah, that's my thought. Great, well, thank you again for this presentation. And um, there's of course the Slack channel, uh, which is there for um, continued um, question and answer. And and of course in the, um, the break room uh, is also more opportunities for continuing discussion. So hopefully we can continue there, sorry. Um, but we should move move on to the next presentation. Uh, so okay. thank you again, and thank you I so much. Now welcome um, Jill Dory. Uh, Jill, pardon my pronunciation. Um, using gesture data to generate real time graphic notation, a case study. Yes. Yeah, so uh, let, let me start by saying that um, my paper was supposed to be in last year's conference, and the performance of the piece, the premiere, was supposed to be uh, at that conference as well. So the paper that was published is a little outdated because since then the piece was performed. So I will add to uh, what I have today more insights about the performance and uh, the rehearsals and stuff that things that are more, I guess, interesting and uh, to to add um, to 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 what the paper has, so the paper is a little outdated. Um, I want to start with uh, just just a little excerpt excerpt from from the piece. Uh, this is what the piece is gonna. This video basically is gonna be today at seven at the concert. Um, so let's hear a little bit of that and 
then I will talk more about um, the piece and how it was made and of course uh, thoughts and conclusions from the performance. Can you hear me well? Because there are some issues with the sound. Yeah, it's it's mostly good. Okay. Yeah. So today at seven, um, I'm sure it will be it, it will sound better. Um, so I actually want to start with the with the instrumentation because it will give a bit more. Uh, I mean, it's important for both the compositional compositional ideas and the actual use of. Uh, real-time graphic notation. And it's written for a cello and an augmented violin bow. Um, and the, the augmented violin bow is, a, is just a violin bow that I modified with, a, with an LED and a contact mic. I'll explain about it later, but I didn't have a better name than an augmented violin bow. Um, but the idea is that uh, using this type of hybrid instrument uh, raises challenges regarding to notation, and especially in the context of action-based scores. Um, the question is how to express this type of electronic instruments morphology in notation. And I thought that using gesture data uh, to drive the notation, it's possible and for what I wanted to do was, was the best approach. So the issue is, um, so normally in a traditional uh, action-based score, there's this uh, presupposed relationship between gesture and sound. So the composer that writes an action knows exactly how it's gonna manifest in sound. Uh, and Dark says that the physical gesture determines the amplitude, pitch, and timbre of each sound event. And Trevor Wishart, in his book on sonic art, calls it uh, sound morphology. So this link between action and sound object, basically the gestural structure of sound. And with electronic performance and with digital performance, this link between gesture on, and sound is often is often broken, and to provide this more convincing sense of authenticity, or to provide back this link between gesture and sound, uh, one solution is to use a uh, NIME or um, basically interfaces for musical expression. Um, but when doing that, we also need to take into account certain gestural elements that affect the sound, such as pressure, speed, and position. And the, augment oh. the augmented bow, 
uh, was built for a piece, an earlier piece that I wrote um, for percussion, cello, and, and this bow. And the whole piece was about bow in actions. So both the percussionist and the laptop player, which was me, uh, playing with bows. So for that, I, I built this instrument. And as you can see, the instructions are only in text, both in the score and um, with the performance patches for Max. So the, the instructions show up at a certain times. And because of those notions of an hybrid instrument that uh, combines the violin, do, violin bow with a digital sound processing component, um, and I wanted it to create this physically en engaging electronic performance that is focused on bone gestures, I came to the conclusion that um, doing it with a notation that also expresses this morphology of playing the bow, it's the best way to go with it. And this is the construction of the bow. Um, so the lead input is used for movement detection, brightness meter, position tracking. Uh, and then the video values are mapped to the audio control and the audio input is from the bow itself. So it's kind of like a closed uh, system which allows for this bow to act as, as its own instrument. Um, for the cello, for the cello, because of the, the focuses on bowing gestures, um, the instruction is to use only the right hand and to produce this kind of uh, like a hollow or airy sound by stopping the string slightly. So that could be either with left hand or with just a rubber band. Um, so one of the main concepts is obviously unifying through uh, bowing gestures and expressing this sound morphology in notation. Um, I also wanted to, as opposed to the text instructions of the previous piece, to create more of an intuitive interpretation environment of notation. Um, and all of that was the main reasons of using uh, or generating the real-time graphic notation directly from gesture data. Um, and the idea was that imitation is a rudimentary, rudimentary form of communication. And so when a performer see an action, it immediately elicits in instantaneous, instantaneous and instinctive res response. Um, so, and if the, the graphic notation is generated from the actual gesture data, um, the imitation is more natural, the, the execution of performance action is more intuitive and idiomatic. So the idea is that it comes directly from the, um, the performance practice of the instrument without the need of interpreting um, a more of a high level symbolic notation. And and this brings the work to what UI calls, calls uh, the pure action-based score. Uh, and the idea is, again, to provide an immediate easy access to music by utilizing images that suggest clear instructions at first sight. Um, but it's not a total uh, sight read. So, I mean, obviously, with every real-time score, there's the element of sight reading. But in this case, it's not um, it's not pure sight reading because the algorithm selects gestures to display display from a closed uh, set of given actions. So it's it can be called a live permutate, perm, permutated or real-time permutative composition. So basically the material is known, but the order is indeterminate. And 
it kind of resonant, resonates uh, Wink, Winkler's idea of a real-time score that can be learned in advance. And the structure itself is basically one uh, big section that is divided to fixed time units, which are organized or um, manipulated isorhythmically. So th this is example from the previ previous piece, piece um, of the cello part, which you have in, in a given time, there are certain actions. And when this sequence repeats in diminution or augmentation, uh, the time of each action changes, uh, changes uh, respectively. And in this piece, the, um, the actions are not fixed, but the, the time units are fixed. And there are also uh, fixed time, fixed units of silence, of inaction. And in this case, these are the, um, the real important time unit. Um, time units where uh, there is no action, there is silence. It kind of gives the um, the formal structure of the piece. So uh, it becomes very important for indicating where where we are in in the piece. Because again, these sections all keep keeps repeating. Um, so within these fixed time, fixed units of time, um, using Markov chain to select select which gestures to show uh, based on augmented bow gestures. Um, so with the max patch, there's also a gesture identification uh, module. And once a gesture is undated and identified, it sends the instructions to which uh, gesture to show on the score to the processing uh, script. And there were, in the performance, there, there were two issues with that. Um, one is that the temporal units, and, and that's, this is something that we, we, we noticed immediately just in the first rehearsal, that the original temporal units I had were just not clear enough. So I had to simplify it a lot, basically making every unit, making less units, but each unit to be much uh, longer. And the other problem was, was with the gesture identification because it, it just wasn't robust enough. I tried I try different ways of uh, doing it. And, but at the end, like it kept giving different results in different uh, places, in different environments. And uh, it had to be, it, it was very, very finicky. So for the performance, I made like a fail-safe mechanism that takes over if the gesture and identification um, algorithm fails. And but this this is something that I need to work on more uh, to make a more robust gesture identification uh, for this piece. Um, and this is the the whole algorithm of the score. So according to an augmented bow input and gesture identification, uh, the Markov chain selects which gesture to show and it sends it through a timed gate uh, to the processing um, processing code to display the score. Um, so obviously in this type of, of piece, when you use gesture data, um, an important part of it was to acquire the data and then how to map it. Uh, so with the cello gestures, I used a, sorry, I used a Mayo armband and with Leo Morello, uh, we recorded all kinds of uh, gestures and we, so the gestures were saved onto uh, text files. And there were also separate text files for EMG data, basically using um, uh, to, to indicate pressure on the bow. And eventually for the piece, 
for each instrument, there were six gestures. And for, in the case of the cello part, for each gestures, there were several text files and there were separate uh, pressure text files. And when there was a gesture selection, um, the computer would randomize the text file for each gesture and the pressure text files and combine the two. So each gesture could be represented in many different ways in many different pressures, pressures on, on the bow. For the augmented bow, uh, I use the recording of uh, bow motion uh, from the, the actual jitter window and then animated them in processing. So th these are the, the videos of different uh, different motions, different Boeing motions as they're shown. Come on. There we go. So in, in the jitter window, because using uh, the lead tracking, uh, essentially you see this, um, oh, there we go. Uh, you see this black screen with, with a dot and the dot represents the uh, motion of the bow for every, oh, it doesn't work at all, for every type, type of action. So I took these and animated them and added some, um, some randomized features and uh, to, to make it again more, more interesting to, to have more possibilities for each uh, movement. So eventually uh, the augmented bow part. Okay, no, no, it works. Um, Sorry, Gilles, I think we have to, to uh, move to the next session soon. So if you could okay. uh, maybe just uh, wrap up quickly and then I think yeah, we, we yeah. have to move so, on. Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, let's just jump to the conclusions because there were, there were all kinds of stuff. Um, so I, I was supposed to talk about all this all this stuff um, during, you know, showing the, the scores and uh, there were issues uh, both, um, well, the main issue was to that because the, um, go part, shows like what the performance is, it's hard to the audience to tell what happened, what happens uh, and how, how the movement that you see on the score relates to what the performer does. Um, so the solution would be to make a better tracking system. Uh, so the performer could see it uh, far away from the computer and the audience can see both the interface and the actions. Uh, there were some issues with the cello part too. Um, showing the pressure, showing uh, differentiating between uh, percussive gestures, but, and yeah, that's future work. But overall, um, the piece was effective and it, it, did, uh, it did work the way it was intended and it also sounded good, so yeah. Great, well, I'm, I think everyone's looking forward to seeing it tonight. Uh at the concert yes it will be played tonight correct the yeah yeah at, yeah great seven. um and well, yeah, yeah very wait, interesting the last, uh, <laughs> the last slide sorry <laughs> uh, oh sorry Did, yeah um but uh yeah really interesting project and um i'm very interested to hear more about the um analysis um and uh with the computer computer vision um kind of approach and um of, of tracking the LEDs and 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 whatnot, and um, uh, I, yeah, I hope we can continue the conversation um, in one of the uh, open se uh, open sessions. So again, sorry to, to rush you, but uh, we should continue to the next session. All right. And well, so thank you I very will, much. Thank you.